I bet you could knit the Mona Lisa. And my friend Karen said, oh yes, of course she could. And I'm sitting there going, Karen? <laughs> so I knitted the Mona Lisa. Hey everybody, Christy Glass here coming to you from Zoomlandia. And I have a special guest on today who I accidentally met because I was posting about this incredible sweater that Harry Styles made famous. And then Ruth said, I am the designer. So welcome. Oh, I, I need to stop you there because oh. I didn't actually design it. Oh, you wrote um, the pattern. No, no. Yeah, no, I, I wrote I, I wrote the hand knitting pattern for it. Yeah. There we go. Well, that's, <laughs> that's actually so good to have that clarification because there's yeah. so much that goes into what we see, right? Mm. So you wrote the hand knitting pattern for it, which is what the episode was about because there was this new knitter and she downloaded that free pattern that jw anderson provided and she knit it up and you are for writing it i what um i watched it she was a young a teenager yes a young girl yeah. first attempt i know it's um i'm so proud of that because um you know so so many young people um it's inspired them to knit and it was a good a good first um, design as well because it, you know, I I've taught probably thousands of people to knit yeah. over the last, you know, and crochet actually, and um, and that's how I teach them. You start off doing your your um, swatches. Sw yeah, but but actually, I I don't get them to cast them off. I get them to build. So they start off with their, you know, cast on and they garter stitch and then, you know, some uh, stocking stitch. So we go through the whole lot. And that's exactly what happens with the cardigan. Yes. So it's a brilliant first project. Um, I'm actually um, making it myself. So I'm testing out my own pattern and I have to say it's really good. <laughs> Good. and uh, I'm making it at the moment actually this is for my great niece who's five years old so what I've done is um I've I've taken the uh the yarn thickness right down mm -hmm. so the equivalent of your um light worsted so our, our DK yeah. and a four millimeter needle instead of the kind of super chunky eight millimeter um whatever mm -hmm. but i followed i followed the instructions yeah. so i'm test knitting my own and <laughs> i've made a couple of amendments because she's tiny and some of it would have been so big so i've i've altered the sleeve slightly I, I haven't put as much um um detail in but i'm just finishing it off i'm, I'm at, i've actually got to the stage where i'm doing the bands <laughs> it. it's the best <laughs> it's so and um Look it's so cute. It's a it's a wee Harry Styles. It's a wee. So um, I'm hoping that I can get this to her at the weekend because it was for her uh, birthday and Christmas, and her birthday was in November. <laughs> and uh, I think she was five. In fact, I know she was five. And you know, Christy, this is the first thing I've made for her, and she's five years old. Isn't oh, that awesome? You know um, what? Okay. So um, hopefully she'll um, she'll be she's such a she's such a cool kid, and she's learning to knit herself. My sister's teaching her, so oh, this is my great niece. I love it. And um, so hopefully she'll she'll get that by, by next week. Yes. <laughs> I hope it still fits. Her. Yes, it will. It will. So before yeah. we go on, let, tell us your first and last name, and then tell us your fiber story. So let's go back to the beginning. Okay, so um, my uh, my name is Ruth Herring. I'm a knit and crochet designer um, and pattern maker and teacher and author and writer. <laughs> I cover the whole lot. Um, and I've been doing it for an awful long time. Um, oh, and lecturer as well. Um, so I learned to knit, uh, my mum taught me, um, I would have been a, about four, year, four years old, maybe five years old, but certainly no older than that. So I was really, really young. I remember, I remember uh, being taught, 
I remember the first thing I made, it was a, um, I wanted to make a sleeveless dress for my doll. Mm. So my mum showed me how to cast on and do knit stitch and I was really pleased. And then she said, right, well, you need to leave, um, you need to leave some gaps for the arms. And I said, but I, I want it sleeveless. She said, yes, <laughs> but you have to leave some holes for the arms. Oh no, I want it sleeveless. <laughs> So I made, made my dog the best sleeping bag. I love it. I know. I tell you, I tell you, but but what what was so good about it is my mum let me make the mistake. Yes. You know, she told she she kind of tried to explain twice. You have to leave these holes for the mm. arms to go through. And because I argued against that, and you know, I, I knew what what I wanted as a designer, wanted it sleeveless. So she let me go ahead, make the mistake, and I never made that mistake again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, and think of how so, much yeah, I was you about four You know, you learned about how to make these, this fabric and make it fit on a body. And that was your first experience. How incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my, my big, um, one of my favorite sayings, um, I can't, I, I can't remember who, who said it, but it, but it's, uh, the line I like is um, get somebody involved and they learn. Mm. So you you can you can kind of preach at somebody forever, and I very much do that. You know, with my students, I I teach I teach um, classes where I teach people from knit right through to how to do pattern making. But I also teach undergraduates as well and postgraduates. So I actually teach fashion students. Um, and get getting them through and getting them on the first road to um, you know hopefully their their success. So it's really exciting. I love passing on the skills. You know, keeping the skills alive. It's 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 so important. Yeah, because um, a lot of fashion programs they don't they don't cover hand knitting. It's all about getting someone else to make a sample of what you have envisioned and then sending that sample overseas and having someone else write it. Right. Um. It, it went through that that period for a while, but I, I, I have to say, Christy, it's, it's actually turning around now and a lot of the fashion students I, I work with now, actually they can knit and they can crochet and they love it and they want to get involved. Um, I, I kind of work with them and as an enabler to mm -hmm. teach them how to create it and, and you know, make it happen, make the magic happen. So, um, so there are, you know, it, it's, it's actually becoming huge amongst um, fashion students now, which is great. So a lot of the fashion schools now, rather than like, oh, just do a drawing and send it to a factory. It's like, learn the process because that is how, well, in my opinion, that's why, I, you know, I'm 63 years old. I'm still working in the industry and my skills are very much sought after by, you know, leading leading designers yeah. um and if i didn't have those skills i, I wouldn't i wouldn't be working in the industry anymore yeah. so i i always um say that to them you know get as many skills as you like okay i'm sure some of the stuff that i make will get sent to a factory and, and made up uh or whatever but yeah, so that's, it's, that's it's incredible that they're learning more skills and and that's got to yeah. make them better designers Hopefully, yeah, yeah. Um, I um, not 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 everyone goes down the knitwear route when they do fashion because I I um, I went to fashion school, but it wasn't until I was there that I started using my skills and actually realised, oh, hang on a minute, I don't have to design ball gowns here and whatever, but I can knit a ball gown or I can knit a, you know. Um, so I started um, kind of blinding them with science because I already had the skills, you know, um, it's it's very much going going back to that now. Um, and some of the schools are actually setting up what they call knit pathways now. Oh, I love that. Um, I know. Well, Central St. Martins, which is one of our biggest, probably, you know, what one of one of the most well known in the, in the world now, you know, students come from all over the world to um they they have a knit pathway and um and i do work with westminster uni which um which is going down that route as well can um, you be 42 and sign up 
Can I? Can yeah. I oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If um, the um, the um, competition to get in, is I'm sure it's <laughs> huge. It's huge. You know, oh, they are, <clears throat> people dismiss. You know, doing something like fashion, they'll dismiss it as hmm. some kind of irrelevant degree but I don't know about in the states but in this country the fashion industry is and we you know sorry the British do I think pr produce the best designers because I think we do have the best colleges and the best best you know um training yeah um so um but I, lo I love working with the the kids that are you know that are about to get to go out into the world and uh, and they you know they um they appreciate sort of my skills and whatever. They actually think I'm cool and it's so funny. <laughs> I think I'm probably, probably old enough to be your grandmother. <laughs> but, but no, it's, um, it, it's, 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 an ex it's a wonderful part of my work, actually. I really, really, really enjoy it. And, you know, seeing somebody start, on, start out in the business, it's a tough business. Yeah. But my goodness, they work so hard. They work so hard. Um, so tell me about your career path. I mean, oh right, okay. So I started. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my 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 mum um, left school at fourteen. Hmm. Um, my mum's going to be ninety five in a couple of weeks' time. Yes. She, she stopped knitting when she was eighty eight, <gasps> and she was still she was still doing little intarsia sweaters and you know ma making things up for her carers children whatever like that mm -hmm. she's so so talented but she left school at 14 um and um she got an apprenticeship in an atelier um where she learned everything she learned how to make fur coats how to make ball gowns how to make gloves how to make you know millinery um you name it you know corsetry she had to learn the whole lot and then um the um rationing came because it was the second world war so rationing came and um, it had to close because um you know oak couture kind of you couldn't buy an oak couture dress on ration coupons so, yeah. so she um that that was that was kind of the end of her professional career but she had all these skills um and passed it on from an early age you know both my older sister's both knit and sew and uh my one of my sisters is an amazing lace maker um uh and um so i i, I had to make my own clothes we we you know we we weren't we weren't an affluent family we we weren't dirt poor but we weren't rich and there were you know four children mm -hmm. um and um if I wanted something, a I was a really I was really skinny child, so unless when I got to a teenage teenager, if if I wanted something, nothing in the shops fitted me that was fashionable. It was it hung off me like a sack. So my mum would take me to the um, we had a wonderful fabric shop in our town, and she'd take me there and she'd buy the fabric and say, right, okay, make it, and then then it won't look like a sack. And so I learned to um, I learned to make make my own clothes. Wow. Um, and um, but bef before that, um, Mum used to make all her own clothes anyway. And she'd always buy um, an extra bit of fabric and make me something that I'd seen in a fashion magazine. So it might have been a copy of a Mary Quant or something like that. Mm -hmm. So she'd make kind of mini versions for me, but taught me to knit and then at the age of 10 I taught myself to crochet because my mum couldn't crochet my sisters couldn't crochet we didn't know anyone to crochet but I wanted to learn to crochet yes. so my mum bought me a book and a hook and the finest crochet cotton you can imagine because she didn't have a clue that you don't normally learn to crochet What's you crochet thread? <laughs> a 1.25 hook and, and and making the you know tiny 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 so she didn't have a clue so that that's how I learned to crochet from a book I was 10 years old um and I've st and she kept those first samples so she gave them back to me um a couple of years ago she said oh look what I found in the suitcase and it was all my my first samples that I did when I was 10 wow. um which was quite emotional actually they were good, oh, <laughs> it was good. good 
Um, and then from there, I realized, oh, hang on, it's a bit quicker that if I use sort of brine nylon double knit and make crochet dresses. So I started crocheting dresses, first of all, from a pattern. And then again, I wanted to make one for myself and I couldn't find a, a pattern that was trendy enough or whatever. So I, I graded down and adults, you know, I was 10 or 11 years old, graded down an adults crochet pattern to fit me as a 10 year old. Um, and then people started um, buying yarn for me to make them. So I was then making crochet dresses and ponchos um, for other people. But I always knew I wanted to be a designer. Wow. Always knew, always knew. You know, knowing yeah. at such a young age is yeah. so rare. And yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I say that because I have two teenage girls and a nine-year-old. So I'm thinking about you as a 10 and thinking if she could do this. Yeah. And the vacillation of passion and what do I do and what do I want is so painful, joyful as a, as a mom. I don't know if you're a mother yourself, but mm. I'm living it right now. And so I do think there is such a gift in knowing so young, Ruth, mm. that, that this is who you are. I mean, you knew your calling at such a young yeah. age. Mm. How incredible. Mm. But I um I used to um I used to sit on the pavement outside my house with with a piece of chalk that I would have found in the garden and I would draw I literally drew my designs on the pavement and 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 I'm still in touch on Facebook I'm still in touch with um, a woman um, who lived a few doors down and she 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 said yeah we used to sit and watch you and you'd be there and I'd be doing all the beehive hairstyles and 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 you know drawing all these things and um you know I was heavily inspired by you know Twiggy and um G Shrimp and all those kind of amazing mm -hmm. um and you know it was it was such an exciting time um to you know to grow up and then of, and um and then of course when it got to you know my real formative years which are the 70s my yeah. goodness what a time for crochet <laughs> and, uh, and knit so um so at school it um certainly you know when i was at my grammar school uh, so from the age of 11 we 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 all knitted or crocheted and so we'd sit around at lunchtime and talk about boys and you know where we were going to go at the weekend you know <laughs> wow <laughs> and we'd we'd uh, we'd we'd crochet and knit and exchange patterns sort of like that um so um so it's kind of you know what what we did yeah. you know we had great fun as well you know we we'd go and wear our designs out and go to discos and whatever like that but but it was this culture of if, if you want it, make it. Yes. But actually when you make it, it takes time yes. to, to make these things. It takes time to learn, but it's something, those skills that you have then for, um, you know, for, for life. So, so um, being a knitwear designer for over 40 years, <laughs> what are some, well, even more, because it really did start with I the sleeping when bag. I was 10. Actually. Yeah, I started with the sleeping bag on the Barbie doll or on the doll. So really we're coming on almost 60 years. So what are some of your pearls of wisdom you could share with aspiring designers? Um, it's hard work. Mm. It's, um, you know, don't, don't go into fashion if, if you, you know, if, if, if you don't want to put the hours in, you know, um, they talk about, you know, the 10,000 10, hours to excellent. I've probably yeah. done 10,000 hours since Christmas. Exactly. <laughs> Some great results out of it but yeah. you know 10,000 hours and some yes so you you certainly don't go into it um if if you know if you're a shirker or if you're you you know you don't like hard work and you don't like um you know criticism and 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 um you know rejection you know don't, don't go into fashion go go into go into something else but don't yeah. go into fashion it's um a lot of the time it's you know it's not glamorous it's incredibly hard work um 
Um, sometimes the deadlines are, are very, very tight. Um, sometimes something might be rejected and you've got to do it again. Yes. Um, and it could be nothing to do with your work. It could be that they don't like the color. Well, that might not necessarily be my fault. You know, yeah. because I might not have, you know, these things are always a collaboration anyway. Um, so, um, but, you know, so many people I teach, um, you know, whether they be undergraduates or people that, that have had a career in something else and then come and learn knitwear because they want to sell their patterns on the internet, whatever like that, what they all have is the passion for it. And you've got to have that passion. And it is, I just think I've got the best job in the world. Like how, you know, how brilliant that, that um, you know, that you can do something that a lot of people call a hobby, but it's my job. Yes. And I love it. Mm -hmm. I love it. I think I've got the best job. So um, you've got, you know, so to have that passion it's fantastic. And I do find those that are successful in fashion um, really do have that passion. Um, um, it's something I've noticed. I've been taking some of the master classes. I don't know if you're familiar with that company, master class, but they'll have, oh, yeah. like I watched the Anna Wintour and I watched Helen Mirren. And it's just so evident. Kelly Wurstler, it's so evident that the passion is mm -hmm. the heart of what they do. And it's so inspiring. So tell us about this, the whole process of J.W. Anderson to now I can download a free pattern. So talk about how it works for those of us who don't get it. Um, so I, I started working with um, J.W. Anderson about six years ago, I think. Um, uh, I, I'm freelance um, and I got a, I got a, phone call um, from their um, knitwear coordinator or manager um, and two people, they, they were looking for somebody to do intarsia work and my name came up from two different sources. Um, one, one was from, McQu you know, somebody at McQueen recommended me and someone somewhere else, I think from a, one of the fashion colleges, they were like, ah, oh, okay, yeah. She's Here's your girl. Me. Ruth this is girl. Girl, the entire <laughs> queen. So, um, so I got, uh, so I got this. Uh, yeah, I got a call out of the blue, um, and um, I, and they had quite an urgent um, design that somebody else had kind of um, given up on, um, and um, yeah, they sent it through, um, and I did the one one sweater for them. Um, I was really pleased with the result. It, it turned out really well. It was of a, a, it, an intarsia swan, but it wasn't just intarsia. It had so many different stitches and so many different shades of white. So it was very much, very textured with all the feathers being different shades of white because the swan isn't pure white, you right. know. Um, and, you know, I got it done within the deadline. It went through to the review. So with J.W. Anderson, Jonathan, who is obviously the creative director, um, it's his company, everything has to go past him. And his standards are incredibly high, as you can imagine. Um, so I, I sent it through and, and I was really pleased with it, but but you 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 never know. And he absolutely loved it. So rather than it just being for women's swear, it got rolled out um, men's swear. Um, so it got rolled out as a sweater, a cardigan, uh, tote bags, men's swear, women's swear, accessories from this one. So I thought, yeah, he liked it. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And so he liked when, it. when you it created that sweater, that sounds like something that can't be made on a machine. So no, no, all these pieces are made. Yeah, um, it could be because the the back and sleeves were plain. So sometimes these those parts of it to bring the to bring the price down, those parts can be machine knitted, and you know the necks and the ribs. Sometimes things like that are, but the main the main intarsia piece, oh, without doubt, it, it has to be done by hand. Yeah, very, very, very skilled, very skilled. Um, but I do the hard, I do the really hard bit because I 
you know, I developed the prototype and the pattern yes. um, for for the um, for the hand knitter. Um, um, so it went on from there. So they they started giving me more and more. And what was so lovely about that that collection that it went into, it was um, um, there's a there's an Italian uh, menswear show called Pitti Pitti Uomo. Pronounce that right. Um, and for that collection, um, J.W. Anderson was asked to launch the whole um, uh, the uh, the whole show. So his show launched was the was the first, and um, all these pieces that I did um, ended up in the show. And it was I watched it stream live. Um, and it was just brilliant because it was the models were just walking through this Italianate garden that was kind of, you could see um, Florence in the background and it was all lit up, the sun was going down and the models were just walking through this amazing Italianate garden. And the audience were just sat on cushions kind of ran around the edges. Um, and I couldn't believe how much of the knitwear got into the show. Uh, well, I did a few days before the before the show. I did get a request to make up about three more tote bags. Can you get them done before we ship it all out to? <laughs> oh my! We, we got them done. I think we got about three three bags done in two days um, oh. by hand. Um, so um, that was great. Yeah, and um, um, I've I um, submit things for quite a few of the. Um, Quite a, few, quite a few of the collections. Not everything gets through. Some of the things that I think, oh God, I'm so proud of it, I love it. And then I get, you know, the first review, oh, Jonathan loves it, I think, brilliant. And then what can happen is that he, um, he might decide to completely go in a different direction. So it yeah. may not fit it. Like, nothing wrong with the sample, it just doesn't fit with mm -hmm. kind of how, how the collection's sort of panning out or whatever. So um, there are some things that I've worked on that I've no idea where they are. I would love them back, but that won't ever happen. Mm -hmm. Hopefully somebody's got them and taking care of them. But the, um, but the patchwork cardigan that became really, really famous, I, I didn't work on it. I, for that collection, which was for the Paris show, I was um, commissioned to work on these full length crochet dresses. Mm -hmm. Uh, that I was super proud of, especially in the show. They came out, you know, when I was at fashion school, you would have your show and you always have the, the bride that came out at the end of the show, you know, this sort of traditional. Well, it wasn't quite like that, but the, the last two garments to come out on that Paris show were the crochet dresses. So I thought, oh, I got the, I got the wedding dress in the yes. J.D. Anderson show. Yes. <laughs> But the patchwork cardigan that was in that show, blink, and you would have missed it. You should, it's still on their website, actually, you should have a look at it, but literally blink and you'd miss it. It was worn as a shawl. So it's so it quite true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So wow. you, you, couldn't, you couldn't even see it properly. It looked great. Yeah. Um, but you, you, you know, you couldn't see it. But it was the fact that the garment was picked up um, by a super stylist called Harry Lambert, mm -hmm. who, who is great. And he styles, Harry, he styles Harry Styles yeah. <laughs> and Twister. Um, so he, he chose that for Harry to wear in that, you know, rehearsals for that TV show, or whatever. And um, it, went, it went ballistic, yeah. Yeah, it went, went absolutely crazy. I wasn't aware of that at all because I had nothing uh, up to that point. I had nothing to do with the um, with the cardigan. You know, I was working on things that were far more complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think I think the cardigan was designed and probably sent straight to straight to you know production. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so yeah, so I wasn't involved in it at all, and and I don't get involved in the production. I just work on the on the prototypes, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, it's uh, it it went absolutely ballistic. Um, and then I I got a call from um, 
the knit department and it was when we we were in lockdown in uh, the uk and lockdown i mean no shops open no you know trying to get a ball of knitting wool because everyone had sold out because everyone was buying online yeah. and um and they they said oh we we need the patchwork cardigan um can you write the knitting pattern for us can you do it tomorrow and i was like well i can't do it tomorrow because actually i've got something else booked in but you know if you give me a, a couple of days i could yeah. you know i could deliver it by monday sort of thing oh no no i think we need it tomorrow and i thought they're not going to get anyone to do that tomorrow <laughs> and i thought so i actually rejected it first of all because I, I didn't have time and then funnily enough by the end of the day they said oh yeah Monday would be great right. so this was, this, this was Thursday so originally they wanted it by the Friday right. so um, the next day um, a van arrived with this huge box I couldn't believe the size of this cardigan it was it's huge yeah. and it weighs I think it weighs over two kilos, two and a half kilos or something. And it was pure, pure wool, you know, merino, most of it was merino wool. So very, very heavy. So I then had to kind of sit there and kind of analyze this cardigan that, that kind of at first glance look, looks quite simple. Um, but I knew that I, I needed, because I'd, I'd heard that there was this kind of frenzy going on and these are Harry Styles fans. So if they want a Harry Styles cardigan, they want it to look like the one he wore. So I very faithfully, um, you know, looked at every stitch. And, but first of all, what I had to do is find attention in my stash. Yes. So I got my, my huge stash of chunky wool out and I, I went through lots of different um, brands. Um, and and hit on one that was pretty spot on tension wise. Yeah. But because the original cardigan, I think it had been the hand knit uh, patchwork bits had been knitted by um, uh, different people. So there was different handwriting within there, which kind of gave it its charm. But for a hand knitter, of course, that's no good. So I had to standardize the tension and, and everything. So what you mean is like, one group of like one knitter knit all the black squares and one knitter did all the green squares. Is that oh, what it was saying? actually done in panels? Oh, so maybe so it, one panel was yeah, one knitter. Sam, yeah, they're done as samplers, which oh. is why I was saying that was how I would teach right. somebody to knit. So mm -hmm. you start off with your one, and then you you just change color, change yeah. change stitch, but you don't cast off. That's right. Yeah. So okay. it was it was all knitted in strips. Mm -hmm. um, so I kept it very very faithful. Um, even down to how it was sewn together, um, and uh, yeah, and and, uh, and and sat down and and wrote the pattern. But there was no no time to get it, you know, test knitted or anything like that. I literally had to had to kind of test knit it myself. And why and, the rush? Um, why why the rush? Right, the rush was because the um, following week, it was the launch of the new collection. So it was kind of the best marketing campaign in the world, putting the JW Anderson brand out mm -hmm. to a new audience. Absolutely incredible because it's, it's, it's not, you know, it's not a huge band, brand like, you know, Louis Vuitton or Chloe or whatever, it's, it's actually, it would be considered a fairly small, small brand, but a growing brand and a very, very important brand um, in the industry because it's, you know, it, it is in incredibly exciting work um, that's so put this, out there. This was, um, response, this, was so this, pattern, this pattern was launched literally a day or two before the next collection. It was like a response to social media. You know, it was saying, look at this viral photo, everyone wants it, and mm. so we will give it to you. It was kind of a brilliant marketing strategy. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, you know, ex extremely generous, I, I have to say, of Jonathan. And he wrote such a lovely piece, you know, the fact that by this time, so many people had tried copying it and posted mm. their TikTok things. You know, yeah. I didn't even know what TikTok was actually. <laughs> 
had no idea. I was like, what, what was TikTok? Um, I love it. And, um, but so by that time, you know, the damage was done. Yeah. It was out there and it was global and it was, and it was um, huge. But, you know, all these young kids were kind of like, oh, we, we've got to a certain point here and we're stuck. We, yes. we, you know, and they were going by this little picture of, of, of Harry wearing it and trying to work it out. Um, but I was actually sent the cardigan that he wore. Oh. So of course we all had to do selfies in it. Yeah. <laughs> My daughter. <so. laughs> like, smell like him. <laughs> oh, and it was it was the um, it, we were going through a heat wave. So to oh, have no. garment that was like nearly three kilos of wool or whatever. Oh. It was so so heavy. Um, well, it's so cool that you were part of that, and I think that. I you know, just after, you know, you saw the joy that it brought um, my guest, Fiamma. It, it's so awesome that J.W. Anderson was so generous to give that pattern out and make it accessible. And I think it speaks volumes to the brand. It's so cool that you had to hear the story behind it. So thank you yeah. for sharing that. Um, will you tell us about your other publications, books, articles? Like, talk more about that side of your Oh, yeah, I know. Because that that is such a small part of my yeah. <laughs> it's, um, actually one thing I, I will say is um, yeah. on I didn't actually really join Instagram in, until lockdown I, I was always very resistant to it because I'm always worried that um, you know I've had work I've had work copied in the past and it, it it it's not it's not nice you know when you put all that effort and expertise and whatever and then somebody just goes and manufactures it or whatever so I was always very resistant to Instagram, but um, but there were so many people that wanted to know about it. I I, I joined, and I I have taught an awful lot of people through the pattern that were first time knitters, and everyone was so sweet and so kind and so keen. Um, so I personally was sort of emailing, well, um, you know, replying, um, DMing people on Instagram, just taking them through some of the stitches. I didn't release any videos and whatever because Jonathan um, J.W. Anderson released their own, which yeah. I was originally asked if I would do that. And I I I was happy to, to do the demo video for them, but it was lockdown and everyone was, sh and, and either they would send a film crew here, which was not going to happen. Yeah. Or I would have had to have gone to their offices, which I didn't feel comfortable about. Mm -hmm. And it made more sense that the actual designer, Yanni, it, you know, it's, it was her baby. Yeah, it was her baby. Yeah. It's not, I wrote, the, I wrote the knitting pattern or whatever, but it's her baby. So she talked uh, beautifully about the inspiration behind it or whatever. She's great. She's great. I love, I love working with her. They're, they're such an exciting team. Yeah. Um, but anyway, my work... Yeah. Um, so uh, so yeah, I went to um, I went to fashion school and got a degree in fashion. And as I said, um, I didn't actually intend on becoming a knitwear designer. I just wanted to be a fashion designer. But it was when I realised that I had these skills that could blind them with science. So I started to knit everything, and then I started um, being entered for competitions, and I won a couple of major competitions for my knitwear, um, which, which was great. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so I kind of went down the, the route to become a knit, knitwear designer. It's what I felt comfortable with and it's what I was good at and it's what I, was, I loved doing as well. Uh, when I came out of fashion school, I, I, I got a job straight away, which was great because it was a major recession um, in the early 80s. But it was working in mass production. So I was then working all over the Far East, designing um, knitwear for, you know, high street shops. So H&M and Topshop and Miss Selfridge and whatever. So I was, I was doing that. And it was, you know, for somebody in their early 20s, it, it was an incredible experience. You know, I'd, you know, my flatmates would be... Um, getting ready to go to work in London and I'd be getting ready to go to Heathrow Airport to fly out to Hong Kong. You know? Fancy! <laughs> and it was, yeah. But it was, so it, 
I learned an awful lot. Uh, I learned a lot about the business side of it. But what was really sad is actually London was, for a young person, London was the most exciting place to be at the time. All the clubs, you know, all the new romantics, all the punks, whatever like that. And I would be in Hong Kong in some grotty nightclub. <laughs> and all my friends would be like dressing up and, and going out in London. So it had its downside. Um, but I'm so glad I, I had that experience. So, I, so that's so I did start off um, in mass production, and then um, there are a few experiences that I won't go into that weren't great. There's a lot of abuse in the fashion industry, or there certainly was then. So I walked out, um, but I started um, taking on commissions, which was my work for people on television, in film, um, which, which was really exciting. Um, so was this and I got offered a, book, I got offered a, a publishing, publishing contract on the back of that. I was gonna say, when you were, when you were working with cele you know, celebrities, were you actually knitting garments for them? Is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they were commissioning something to, um, you know, it might have been, um, they might have been an author and they had a book coming out so I would knit them something to help promote their book or cool. um, in a film or on tv or something so my knit was, was being seen um on um you know on the screen or whatever I loved it was so it was such fun it was great I got to meet some some very famous people and they were they all loved my work and whatever like that so I got a um a book contract with pavilion books and an American publisher as well. And I, this is, I think this is my original first copy of Knitting oh. Masterpieces with Wait, hold the that up. Hold that up with Gauguin. Look so that, that, that painting by Gauguin was called When Will I Marry? And, um, but funnily enough, when I did, when I did my final collection with my degree show, I actually did some, some knits based on Gauguin's paintings and other post-impressionists um, and they, they, they worked out really well so I um, so it made sense that um, I could uh, work on the Gauguin's and also they, there wasn't a copyright issue with the Gauguin's unlike Lichtenstein's Wham! Whoa! Um, which um, we had to, my publisher approached Lichtenstein's estate to get permission. So we had to pay for permission to get, get that one done. Uh, but I, I, I kept the sweater, I love it, I've worn it. So that sweater is like 35 years old now and I, I still love it and it's been washed and worn and it hasn't fallen to bits. But what inspired the book was actually, um, um, have you have you um, have you heard of Bob Bob Geldof, um, British? He was in a band called the Boomtown Rats, a punk band. Um, but he was the guy who set up the concert Live Aid with the. Um, oh yes. Yeah, Bob Geldof. I was Geldof. Just hearing about that on Eighties on Eight yesterday. They were saying Band Aid, but I think it's the same. Yeah, Band Aid was the um, was the song, and then on the back of that they did a massive concert in uh, 1985 which yeah. was called Live Aid which yeah. I went to which was yeah. brilliant um, but um, his girlfriend at the time was a TV uh, presenter and journalist called Paulie Yates and um, she wanted to commission something from me so um, so I ended up having dinner with her um, and my friend that I co-wrote the books with, who was a PR, fashion PR girl. And uh, so Paula was looking through some of my work and she, and she went, oh my God, she said, I bet you could knit the Mona Lisa. And my friend Karen said, oh yes, of course she could. And I'm sitting there going, <laughs> so I knitted the Mona Lisa. Rude. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, you need to hold that up a little longer. How many different colors do you remember? Yeah, so um, 
so again, I kept it, I kept it kind of very faithful to the, um, the <laughs> it's bonkers, absolutely bonkers. And it was that, um, so it was, it was that statement by Paula and, um, and my friend saying, well, of course she could meet the Mona Lisa. And, and then af after, I said to Karen, do you understand what you've just signed me up for? She yeah. said, yeah, you can do it, Ruth. And I thought, well. <laughs> well, actually, I could. So I did. Now, did um, you chart that out first or did you just... I still, I still got, I still got the original chart because we're we're talking about before computers came out. Oh, so graph so paper. I, I, yeah, yeah, piece of graph paper, and I hand drew it with pencil crayons. So I, so yeah, so I drew the Mona Lisa. That's one thing I'm uh, also say about people that want to go into design. Um, improve your drawing skills as well. Mm -hmm. it really does it really does help um you know freehand drawing um oh my gosh do you have any more show and tell for us uh oh i do yeah so after that i then the book was really successful and then the second one came out which i did with the um worldwide fund for nature the uh, charity and that had marie halvin wearing the tiger my my daughter has two of these suits she's got she's got one of these but she's but um uh when was it about a year ago I re-knitted it and I knitted it in gray as a white tiger because uh, I'd been watching the tiger king <laughs> I saw that post <laughs> So I said, yeah, the tiger, the tiger king meets the intarsia queen. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh my gosh, tiger king. Oh, that's an early COVID memory. I know, I know. I know. But getting, um, that's Marie Helvin. Now, when I was a fashion student, she was, her and Jerry Hall were the biggest um, supermodels at the time they were the original supermodels yeah. and I remember the first time I went to a Paris show um oh gosh who were the designers and both Jerry and Marie were on the catwalk and I just sat there open-mouthed and the great thing was um when I got my publishing contract with Pavilion she was signed to the same publisher so they just they had just published her book, Catwalk. And um, so they, they, they picked up the phone. They said, oh, we've got this young designer, knitwear designer, you, you, know, you won't have heard of her, but she's asking if you would model the front cover of her book for the Worldwide Fund for Nature. So she went, oh, that sounds really cool. Oh yeah, why doesn't she come around and you know, we'll have a chat about it. So she invited me around to her apartment. <laughs> Were you so nervous? Oh, was I? So I, so I went round, you know, with a load of sweaters and, you know, to, to talk it over. And she had the most beautiful apartment with all the David Bailey photographs of her around. It was just beautiful. So we got there and I, I was with Karen that I did the book with. And um, so Marie was like, oh, it's so nice to meet you girls. Um, would you like a drink? Now this was about four o'clock in the afternoon. And um, so I was expecting a cup of tea and um, she came back and she said, oh, I've only got champagne. <laughs> champagne it is. Like rock and roll. You know, ah. This is the day, you know, these days I think people drink, you know, Prosecco and, um, and champagne or whatever, like it's going out of fashion. Yeah. This this was about 1985 when champagne, you know, it was really special occasion. So yeah. to be offered a glass of champagne at four o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> Tuesday afternoon, was was I thought now this is glamorous. I, I like this. And she was just she was really up for it. She was so 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 nice, and she tried. I had the suit which fitted her perfectly. Yeah. So she went and tried it on and she came swanning in with it on and 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 I was just pinching myself I thought oh. wow this is the woman that I saw on the Paris catwalk who's now wearing 
one of the things that I've um, I've designed, and she, she, yeah, she was she was great, and um, and she's you know she said, oh, who who else is in the book? Uh, who else have you got? And we'd got some good people on board, and she said, oh, I think you need some more men. She said, I know who we can get, Imran Khan, who's now the president of Pakistan, I think, um, but he was a cricketer, world famous cricketer at the time. So she picked the phone up. Hey, Imran, it's Marie here. <laughs> You're crazy. Isn't it was so, absolutely it? bonkers. You're like, where am I? 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 Who are these? It's, isn't it so nice, though, that people are generous? I know, I know, and I know. Most people start as nothing. And I mean, of course, you can be born into something, you know, some sort of special privilege, but isn't it great when women especially are generous to other women and they recognize their art and want to help? I mean, I think it's so beautiful. Yeah. 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 Well, we've uh, yeah. been talking forever, so I, we <laughs> wrap it up, but I, I am, I am fascinated by you. I find you to be like a living museum. I want to see all the pictures. I want to go to the Ruth exhibit. <laughs> I'm loving it, but I just want to know um, what's, what's coming up for 2021, 2022? Oh um, right. Um, JW Anderson will continue my collaborations with them, which is great. Um, as well, the, um, I work with other designers. Um, Katie Ann McGuigan, I've been, I've been working with since she left Westminster Uni. Um, her collection is actually about to drop. It still hasn't, her autumn winter collection, she still hasn't actually put it out there. So I think it's any time now. And I, the knitwear is, is just, she's such a talented girl. I absolutely love collaborating with her. Uh, that will continue. Um, I'm also working with another ex Westminster student um, called um, SS Daily, Stephen Stokey Daly, who works with Harry Lambert, so he's already had his stuff worn by Harry Styles. So I, um, I did the knitwear for his um, autumn winter collection, which is, he, he's gonna be really big. I'm so excited and he's such a sweetheart. They both are actually, Harry Lambert is as well. So that's, that will, that's a new collaboration that will continue. Um, I've got a, I've got something that I can't talk about because I've got to sign an NDA, which is awesome. unbelievably exciting. Um, plus, I've got another project with a major British retailer that um, is is in development at the moment. So that's really exciting, and that's going to be under my name. Um, Ruth, so loads that's of, so let's cool. Do you know what I do you know what I really really would like to do though I'd like to do part two and part two yes. because with this one I want to I want to go back to it and I would really really like to do some knitwear with um some more modern artists um some 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 unknown artists yes but I, I would really, really like to collaborate with Grayson Perry, the, um, the artist um, Potter. Um, unbelievable, I would love to work with him. So I'd love to do another Knitting Masterpieces part two. Do it. And the, wild, the wildlife thing, you know, this book came out in the late eighties. My goodness, we are in such, you know, and I was banging on about the environment back then and no one was listening. I would <laughs> love to go back to that and just say, look, hang on a minute, folks. Yeah. We have COVID, but actually what is going on with our planet is yeah. major. So I'd love to go, go back to that as well and just revisit and maybe come up with some other ideas and whatever like that. But so, yeah, it's a lot to do. Not enough hours no, no. in the day. I know people people say to me, "Well, why don't why don't you do this, that, and the other?" And it's and and I I have I have to sort of prioritize, kind of in in you know what what pays my my bills and yes. like that. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, also I have 
I have bags and bags and bags of samples going right back to 1980. Everyone says, why don't you publish those patterns, whatever like that? You know, it takes, well, you probably publish patterns. It takes a long time to actually get a pattern out there, you know, and graded and, and, and up on the internet. And um, so one day I'd like to get some of those, those you know, the, those patterns out there, maybe, who's to say, but... Well, I have, still going. <laughs> I, I have just loved our chat today. I find you such an inspiration and I am so happy you have Instagram so that we can follow along. I know. And it's just been, I hope you can feel it. I just, it's been such a pleasure for me and I know it's going to be a pleasure for all those watching. So thank you so much for spending this hour with us. Oh, thank you for inviting me. And your crochet piece behind you and on you is that. Gorgeous. This, um, this is, oh, th this is, this is for me. So this is a special dress. I've been making this for about 20 years. <laughs> and then this one, this, this one I made um, for my, um, um, my big birthday a few years ago. So I made this for my six years. But you know, I don't get a chance to wear it now. I, you know, I always wear knitwear every day. Um, but something that's got a bit of sparkle in it. So I thought, you know, I'm going to dig out something with sparkle. And this is made with American. Um, is it art yarn? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's silk with the beads and sequins <laughs> already. Um, and and the yarn was gifted to me by one of my my lovely students for my birthday. So I made. Uh, so I made this. So um, yeah, I, I love I love crochet. I've been doing so much knit recently that actually I liked I like to swap. I like yes. to swap and do a bit of both. It's um, yeah. So um, gosh, thank you so much, Ruth. And I guess for now yeah. we'll say goodbye. Bye bye. Thanks.